So IGF-1 uh, insulin-like growth hormone and, and growth hormone itself uh, also in, in the short run don't seem to be healthy, at least in animal studies. And also Neobarazolite for Albert Einstein College of Medicine has studied long-lived families, centenarian families. Uh, and what he's found, in particular to IGF-1, is that uh, some families actually can have high levels of IGF-1 but still live a long time. And the reason for that is that they they don't have the IGF-1 receptor that's as active. Is that Laurent syndrome? Uh, that's, uh, I understand that's the growth hormone as well. So it's, it's similar. No, his are, his are Ashkenazi uh, Jewish families okay. that have okay. sent uh, 100, 100 years old. But it's a similar concept, is that if you're not responding to these hormones, um, it doesn't matter really how much the body produces, you still have an effect that mimics um, essentially the, the benefits you want. Um, it's, it's interesting actually that the growth hormone is stimulated uh, by fasting. There must be something, and I'm, I'm unaware of exactly why, uh, but we know that, that fasting doesn't lead to uh, bigger animals, it's actually the opposite. So it could be that, that and I, now I'm just speculating, but I think it's worth discussing and thinking about that these short-term bursts of hormones may help the body recover from injury, uh, but those little spikes don't last long so that you're not uh, having any downside. The other thing about growth hormone, and I know a lot of people, including um, viewers of this show, will be wondering, what about growth hormone? Is it dangerous in the long run? Should I be taking it? Should I not? Now. Now, I haven't seen any evidence that growth hormone is going to make you live longer. Um, typically, it's the other way around, that people who have a lack of growth hormone activity live longer. Uh, Leron dwarfs uh, tend to have less disease. Uh, but in the short run, if, if you need to uh, repair your body and, and build up uh, new muscle, which of course prevents falls and accidents in the elderly, you know, I, I'm perfectly willing to entertain the possibility that that building up body bulk and testosterone is the same mm -hmm. uh, will prevent these accidents that actually largely uh, are a problem for longevity. There's a saying actually that the the way to longevity, uh, the best way to longevity, is to hang on to the handrail. And so it's it's real trade off. <laughs> <laughs> It's a trade-off, you know, that if I was to summarize everything that I've learned over the last 30 years, it's um, everything in moderation and, and nothing, don't do anything too consistently because it's like a frog in a hot water bath or in a, in a, in a fry pan. Your, your body needs to be primed and then allowed to relax and, and challenged and then allowed to relax. And so these diets and, and these growth hormone spikes I think they're good, uh, you just don't want them on all the time because then your body doesn't have a chance to recover and you don't get the, the long-term benefits. Okay, so uh, tangenting off the elevation of growth hormone during a time-restricted eating fast of 16 to 18 hours or even a longer fast, uh, many people believe that the optimal time to engage in resistance or strength training might be right before you have your first meal so that you're still fasting, your growth hormone levels are activated and you'll get maximum benefit from the anabolic stress of the exercise, which of course is increasing PGC1 alpha, mitochondrial biogenesis, and a lot of other benefits that occur during exercise. Do you have any... any uh, yeah, yeah. yeah this, this is really the... You're talking about the cutting edge of thinking. So people who are discussing that idea, I think are similar, similar to the way I'm thinking about biology. Um, you know, again, in the full disclaimer, this is now we're discussing the cutting edge of science, so we don't know fully the answers to this. But what makes sense to me is that uh, we don't want too much protein in our lives. We don't want to eat a steak every meal because what we've learned through the work of uh, David Sabatini and, and many others in the field, Matt Caberline, that at, at least in animals, and, and it looks like in people as well, that inhibiting the mTOR pathway by having a lack of amino acids, certain amino acids, is healthy and does actually lengthen lifespan in animals. But does that mean that you shouldn't eat protein? No, absolutely not. There are times when eating protein is important. Same for probably testosterone, same for growth hormone. And then, but now, now we're getting into the nitty gritty is, if you are pulsing these things, 
when do you do them together and when you do them apart and to me and what you know let me talk about what i do personally because that's that's actually a, a better way to approach the discussion if i'm going to have a steak i try to be vegetarian but let's say i'm going to have a, a protein shake i'm going to do that just before or just after i've exercised but then i'm going to also have a period in the week where i don't have a lot of protein and i might just have some salads and that's where i get my protein so my body is going like this but it's not out of sync at times when my body needs protein or, or for instance needs growth hormone so I, i think what you're what you're saying is is really going to be the future that we can't just say doing one thing constantly is the right thing to do and we have to time these beautifully um otherwise we're causing uh stress and damage uh but then preventing the healing process by doing something else uh well so the reason that i take um glycine actually specifically trimethylglycine is is actually to to counter what i think might be going on with an nad booster um i'm certainly not an expert in in glycine other other than that but i i can talk about um the trimethylglycine component if you like sure sure um yeah so this is a big question in in my field so just to take a step back my my field and a lot of what my book is about is being able to trick the body into being hungry and having exercise and one of the molecules that does that is NAD mm-hmm. uh NAD uh stands for nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide and we have it in our body as we exercise as we get hungry it goes up as we get older it goes down uh and it's needed for life it's also needed for turning on these defensive enzymes that we work on called sirtuins now to raise NAD levels what we've done in my lab to mice for the last decade is we give them precursors to NAD so we give them molecules like nicotinamide riboside or NR or nicotinamide mononucleotide also known as NMN not to be confused with M&Ms <laughs> which will have the opposite effect and uh, so NMN is is what i take each day i take a, a gram of it but the thing with nicotinamide mononucleotide NMN is that it it has this nicotinamide group on it it hangs off the the main part of the chemical and it's the first bond to break and so we see in animals and even in humans that the levels of nicotinamide go up quite rapidly after taking NMN or NR and too low too high levels of nicotinamide are not good um in part because the nicotinamide gets excreted through the kidneys and it's done so that happens because it becomes methylated into methyl nicotinamide and methyl nicotinamide has been used for for years as a marker of all sorts of things in, including at least experimentally for parkinson's disease but the concern that's that's been talked about uh, in social media especially is is this drain of methyl nicotinamide a problem the, the methyl groups are are needed for the body we need methyl for a whole range of things including um antioxidants and uh, so as a precaution i take trimethylglycine so that uh, i continue to give the, my body a source of methyl groups now i don't know if that's true uh, people ask me all the time i take it as a precaution because i know that trimethylglycine is not going to hurt me glycine is good as um and the other thing is trimethylglycine is also known as betaine uh which on human cells is very good for them um including protecting them against stress So I don't I don't see any downside it's not an expensive molecule and the upside is that I'm preventing my body from being drained of methyl groups but the reason that I can't say for sure that it's ne- necessary actually is that our bodies can make methyl groups there's a whole pathway in fact I did a PhD on it when I was in Australia 30 years ago um but so I do take it as a precaution um knowing that, that it's probably not doing anything um except goodness for my body Well it w- it was a team and I'm not just being coy about that. We we landed at the right place at the right time. We discovered genes that control aging in yeast cells. Uh, ironically that's where NAD was first discovered. Um and I I would argue that if yeast weren't making alcohol we probably wouldn't have discovered NAD for a long while. Uh but yeah the the Germans just did discover NAD and we learned in high school that NAD is essential for all these reactions. So we knew that but what we didn't realize until the late 1990s was that the levels of NAD in organisms such as yeast and and in, in our bodies as well they're really dynamic it's not just that it's a housekeeping molecule keeping us alive 
during the day it's going like this and in a yeast cell it's going like this and that was a shock because first of all anything that, that's that important you think how can it go up 50 percent or 100 percent during the day without killing us turns out it does and it's actually very helpful and the reason that we think it goes up and down is NAD isn't just making chemical reactions happen, but there are proteins that sense the amount of NAD in the cell. And when times are tough, we're hungry or we've exercised, NAD levels will actually go up and turn on these defenses. And that's why when you take a molecule like NMN or give an NMN to a mouse, what we think is happening is that you're tricking the body into thinking that it's exercise or that it's hungry because the NAD levels will go up. So you get the benefit, the protective benefits of these without actually having to necessarily exercise or diet. But if you're, if you're wondering, is it, is it fine just to take the pill and sit on the couch and eat potato chips? Uh, the answer is uh, probably not. We, we, I mean, in, in full disclosure, we have published that resveratrol and NMN that work through similar mechanisms do make mice healthier, even if they're fatter and don't exercise. But here's the important thing, for those who want to maximize their body's potential, maximize their life, we find that the combination of low calorie diets and these NAD boosters, or in the case of resveratrol we showed, has a, a doubling effect. They're actually additive and so it's not no excuse just to sit around and just pop a pill. Right, well so there, there are a variety of ways to raise NAD um, and this list is not a, exhaustive, but I'll, I'll talk about what ones we know of that have been really tested ex, um, fairly extensively. Uh, so you can raise NAD levels just by taking uh, nicotinic acid or niacin. And uh, so niacin has been used for decades to lower cholesterol. And uh, the only side effect is flushing. Uh, you feel a little bit warm. Uh, there are slow release versions that will raise NAD and actually, there are some of us, myself included, that are entertaining the possibility that the benefits you get uh, are in part because it also raises NAD. Uh, but in head-to-head -head studies that I've read, mm -hmm. niacin won't raise NAD levels the way some of these other molecules do. Um, and I think the reason is that niacin is just a, a tiny part of the NAD molecule. Uh, and so, you know, let me think of an, an analogy. It'd be like saying, uh, I can build a house out of bricks, but if you don't bring the mortar and the windows and the doors and the roof, uh, you, it's going to be a lot harder. Um, and so the windows and, and the roof come in with molecules like NR, which is nicotinamide riboside, and NMN, which is NR, but with a phosphate group added. So now you've got more of the house built in, and you're almost at NAD um, and so we're getting closer and uh, so there, there's there's a debate it's uh, it's a bit of a silly debate which is better NR and MN in mice I can tell you that that both work uh, well to improve the health and the lifespan of mice we've done a lifespan of, of NMN we haven't uh, we're repeating it looks good NR is published that it extends the lifespan of old mice. So they're both great. It's really, uh, I, I think it's semantics to say that one is, you know, 10 times better than the other. It's just not, not the case. Um, they both get into cells. Uh, they're, they're transporters for NR. There's a new, newly discovered transporter for NMN. Ah, that must have been the last few months. I have not seen that. Right. Yeah. So. It came out of um, Dr. Shin Imai's lab uh, mm -hmm. at Wash U Medical School, um, and I wrote a News & Views uh, article on it. It looked really convincing. What we don't know, though, is, is this transporter in all cells or is it just in the gut? Um, and so, you know, that remains to be seen. But it it really doesn't matter. It, it, it's, it's irrelevant. We can talk about transporters all, all day. Mm -hmm. What really matters is, do, do you see health benefits and do you see NAD levels going up? Um, and I guess the third important thing is, are there any side effects or negative side effects? Um, I haven't seen any negative side effects and I've certainly seen niacin, NR and NMN raise NAD levels and provide health benefits. Um, and as I mentioned, NR and NMN um, seem to be better than niacin. 
Well, so th there are two ways to think about it. One is, can you stimulate the body to make more NAD uh, because it is recycled? Um, and the other is, which which would I focus my uh, thoughts on more, which is if we give the, the cells so much precursor, they have no no alternative but to put it into NAD. Uh, and I think that those two ways of thinking, are your way and my way, are guiding what we do. Uh, I think it's possible that low doses of um, nicotinic acid could stimulate the body and um, force the cell to make more than it otherwise would. But it would have to make more than it otherwise would because the amount of NAD in your body is, is you know, it's in the gram amounts. So milligram amounts are probably not going to, you know, by mass action, push it up. But what I take away from it is that short-term exposure to metformin high doses, uh, yes, it will inhibit complex one and lower ATP. Uh, that's also true for resveratrol, by the way. And, what and, we, ber and berberine too. Yeah, right. But it, I regard it as hormesis, a, a little bit of what doesn't kill you actually makes you stronger. And so the body recognizing that there's low ATP levels and higher AMP levels will stimulate AMP kinase, uh, which is known to be beneficial uh, and will actually compensate by revving up the mitochondria and building uh, more mitochondria in various organs, uh, particularly the muscle of your body. And so, you know, a little bit of inhibition leads to a, a kickback and a compensation. So that's why I think that um, actually metformin is beneficial, even though it starts out as a, um, as long as you don't overdose it, a, a relatively mild mitochondrial inhibitor. Um, and, you know, the, in the history of humanity and in animal studies, there's a long literature of molecules that if you give a lot of do high dose acutely, uh, it can actually kill you. Uh, but mm -hmm. little doses, um, as long as they don't do harm, can have a positive effect in the long run. And you know, this, the same is true for fasting. If, you've, mm -hmm. if you don't eat, uh, we know what happens, you'll starve to death. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you trick the body into thinking times are tough without leaving a long lasting da any damage, then the body actually do does better in the long run. And we, we weren't looking at resveratrol. In fact, I'd never heard of resveratrol when we started working on it. The, the story goes like this. It's, it, it's a pretty funny story. We had purified the SIRT1 enzyme from humans. And we were looking in collaboration with a company called Biomol. Um, and the lead scientist there was Conrad Howitz. He deserves a lot of credit for this. We were looking for molecules that would inhibit the enzyme. And, um, it was a collaboration and we were sharing stories and results. And uh, Conrad calls me one day and he says, uh, are you sitting down? I went, uh, I am sitting down, what's up? And he goes, we've got these strange molecules that may activate the enzyme. Uh, and then I, that, that was of course music to my ears because we didn't know that NAD could be used at that point. We were just on the verge of discovering that. But what we did know that was that we, we wanted to activate these enzymes because they're beneficial we knew in yeast and in, in worms that if we put, uh, and in flies, if you put extra copies of the SIR2, SIR2 and gene, they would live longer. So we wanted more, more goodness. Uh, but finding activators of enzymes is extremely rare. Uh, I think there's only a few examples in the whole history of pharmaceutical development. And when you find one, typically people call BS on you. But here was Conrad saying that we've got something. Uh, so we tested it in the lab and we could repeat his results. Yes, it was an activator. Uh, but to really show that it was true, we had to put it on some yeast cells uh, and on some human cells. And we did that and we found that it extended their lifespan uh, in the case of yeast and in the case of human cells, protected them. And you needed the SIRT1 gene for that to work. So it wasn't just an antioxidant effect, it was actually through the same mechanism that we were hoping it, it, it was. But you, you asked Joe about these other molecules. Well, we tested with Conrad, uh, well, we, we screened about 18,000 of them. Wow. And we published 21 activators in that first paper in Nature Journal, 2003. Now, resveratrol was the best one we had at the time. And it got the most attention because the red wine story was pretty funny and interesting to the media. But there were there others that were very close to resveratrol in structure and in 
potency. You mentioned quercetin, fisetin or fisetin. Mm -hmm. uh, these are plant molecules as well. They are all produced in response to stress. Uh, when the plants are stressed, dehydration or UV light. And uh, they seem to have benefits on organisms when we consume them. Um, interestingly, what has later been discovered, though rarely acknowledged, is that these same molecules work on killing senescent cells. You know, the, mm -hmm. your viewers will know of senescent cells, the zombie cells that accumulate in our body and cause havoc. Now, others have shown that quercetin, uh, Jim Kirkland and others, uh, have senolytic properties, same with fizzitin. Um, but what's not recognized typically or admitted is that these molecules were discovered 15 years ago to also be SIRT1 activators. So I thought so. Yeah, so it's really interesting. Now, what I think is going on is uh, evidence for a, a hypothesis that Conrad Howitz and I came up with, which we published in Cell, I think it was the year 2005. Anyway, the, the, the idea is called xenohormesis, X-E-N-O-hormesis. And it's the idea that we've evolved to sense our environment and molecules that are produced by plants and bacteria in our environment when they're stressed, if we consume those or put them on our skin, for example, our bodies will recognize those. We've evolved to sense our world around us. And that's a very good way of getting a heads up if your plants are running out of nutrients or, or the water table is drying up. And you know, before we were conscious and we had brains, this was the best way for a worm or a fly to know that times were probably going to deteriorate. And, in, and what you want to do is get ready for those times of adversity before they actually happen. And uh, so that, that can explain why so many molecules from the plant world have given rise to medicines and why some molecules like resveratrol and quercetin, even, even aspirin, have remarkable health benefits and target many different enzymes in the body that seems to be well beyond what uh, coincidence could explain. Uh, one is the, the question of what is resveratrol really doing? You know, we came out with the bold uh, hypothesis that resveratrol works through serotonins in yeast cells and that's how it was working. That was very controversial. Uh, it was a shock that you could actually activate an enzyme. It was a shock that you could use one molecule, a quote unquote dirty molecule, to target very specifically one enzyme. And I've basically spent the last decade uh, testing that hypothesis time and time again. And we have new research that uh, builds upon a science paper that we had in 2013 that said that yes, resveratrol is truly acting on this enzyme. We now have mice that we've engineered so that they are resistant to the effects of resveratrol on the enzyme. And uh, those results look really promising. Uh, the question is, does resveratrol still work if you block its ability to activate the SIRT1 enzyme? Uh, and the answer looks like uh, preliminarily Yes, so that that's good. So the science really solid, and I wanted to to let everybody know that that's that we're still working on the science. Yeah, I, I want to quickly look at the literature because I, I recall that there were were connections between sirtuins and heat shock proteins. I can't remember which controls which, but they they're connected. But in 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 principle, you're right, Joe. That the this is all evidence of hormesis that you can stimulate the body's ability to fight against problems. Um, so it, it's thought that it, a little bit of heat, even a little bit of cold, a little bit of hunger, uh, some exercise, some hypoxia, lack of oxygen in your body. These are all ways of activating, activating these defense pathways. The same pathways that we've talked about before, such as sirtuins, there are seven of those, um, which by the way, NAD and resveratrol will both activate. Uh, just to recap the mTOR, which lower amino acids, um, particularly leucine and arginine, and the AMP kinase pathway, so metformin and inhibition of uh, complex one. So these are the, the main three defensive pathways. There are others, but what's downstream of these pathways are things like heat shock proteins and transcription factors that turn on DNA repair enzymes. Um, there's a whole litany, actually, that there's a thousand papers per year on what are these sensors, as we call them, what do they do downstream? And, the, here's, the, here's the good news, actually. We, we used to think that we had to understand what everything those sensors do to, to be able to understand aging and be able to live longer. But what I've been arguing, actually, for many years now is that we don't need to fully know what they do. Heat shock proteins are great, definitely part of it. But we don't need to know everything. As long as we can find the right 
nodes in the cell to turn them on in the right ratios at the right time, the body has evolved to take care of the rest. And we're getting to the point, fortunately, it's been really remarkable to see where we know what these nodes are, we have the tools to tweak them, we can also change them naturally by fasting and exercising, we change them with molecules that we can ingest or inject. But now that the cutting edge is, now with this toolbox, when do you apply them and how much and in what combinations? And that's really what people like myself and you and, and your listeners are onto right now. There's actually more than 14 different parps. They do drain NAD quite effectively. In fact, in my lab, we've discovered another part that when you have inflammation, it drains NAD as well. So it does make sense to um, slow them down, as you're mentioning, um, on, in some cases inhibit them. But, I, but you have to be really careful because you do need them. We only- yeah, Why would you want to inhibit them? Because why would you want to inhibit DNA repair? Well, you, you, you wouldn't, but you want to inhibit their overuse of NAD. Right, by by decreasing these insults that would cause them to be activated. That's the best way, right? Yeah. Because then you get the, the benefits of low DNA damage and the benefits of high NAD. Uh, we had a science paper in 2013 that connected all of this together that the sirtuin gene or the sirtuin enzyme, this SIRT1 we've talked about, actually controls PARP activity. Uh, and PARP1 is normally inhibited by uh, a protein called DBC1. And then uh, sort of one controls that uh, that process. And uh, long story short, you want to activate PARP, but not too much. And so that's what we think is going on here, this fine tuning. But but actually, to get to what's really more interesting, I think, is how do you keep your levels of DNA double strand breaks to a minimum? Mm -hmm. And I think that's the key, one of the main keys to longevity. Um, and there's two reasons. One you mentioned, which is that double strand breaks drain in AD. The second, um, which I think you're, you're going to be familiar with because you've read my upcoming book, is the idea that DNA double strand breaks also disrupt the cell's epigenome, the storage of uh, the, the information that we get passed down from our mothers and fathers, mother and father, mother and father. Um, and the packaging of, of the DNA. We, let, we can get that to that in a minute, but basically what happens is if you have a broken DNA, proteins such as the sirtuins will leave their normal sites where they're regulating genes and they'll go help repair with PARP as well, but then they don't all find their way back to where they came from. They actually, some of them get lost and get distracted and over time, what we see is that these proteins that are essential for maintaining cellular identity and cellular function will be lost. And we see that in yeast cells. Yeast cells get old because they're moving between breaks and back again to these to genes. Um, so it's, it's twofold. So before we get to the science, and, and I'd love to touch on that, the key ways to reduce double strand breaks, I think, I don't know about the radiation, I, I have to trust you on that one, but um, CT scan about a trillion breaks. Um, you know, one per cell at least. And just living DNA will break, especially when it's replicating itself and a cell divides, you'll have a break. So even if you live in a lead box at the bottom of the ocean, you'll still have a break, <laughs> uh, which I don't recommend doing. Um, but you can minimize it. You know, I go through the, the DNA scanners occasionally and I ask the, the people there, and I've researched this as well, the amount of radiation is about the same as you get on the flight, but, but why double your exposure? You know, to me, it doesn't make sense. So I try to, if I can, avoid uh, that exposure. X-rays, um, dental X-rays, you know, they're important. I'm not going to deny that. And I think that we should know what's in our mouth. But I, I would try not to overdo it. I think any physician who does X-rays should have a good reason for doing it. Um, and usually they do. But, uh, you know, be aware that there are consequences to exposing your body to radiation. Yeah, so we're, we're writing up three papers now, and so this is a sneak preview of what hopefully will be published later this year. And what we've discovered over the last 10 years, and this has been a 10-year project, so I'm really grateful to the scientists in my lab who've had the endurance. We've discovered what we think is, is very strong evidence for what we call now epigenetic noise as a cause of aging, not just in, in mammals, but throughout life, even in yeast cells. So what does that mean? So let, let's just 
quickly do a biology lesson for those who haven't been in high school for a while. So the, the genome we know, DNA genome, epigenome is the organization of that DNA and it, the epigenome tells the cell that they should turn on this gene to be a nerve cell and in a liver cell turn on that gene to be a liver cell and that's epigenetics and cells inherit that information just as much as they inherit their DNA. Um, so in my book what I, I am proposing is that those two types of information, genomic and epigenomic, um, they're quite different. The genomic, the DNA is digital, which is very well preserved and can last a long time. We know that DVDs last longer than cassette tapes. Um, but the problem for the epigenome is that it's analog information and anyone who's had a cassette tape uh, or, or, or a record knows that you can, you can pretty easily scratch these or lose the information. Um, in fact, you can scratch a DVD uh, and lose the information. We actually think that aging is similar to those scratches, that the information to be young again is still largely in our bodies, but we can access, our cells can access that information just by you know, metaphorically scrubbing the DVD or polishing it up so that the cell can read the, the right genes, or in the case of the DVD, the right song. Uh, so with that in mind, let me explain what we've discovered. If, so we literally have, not literally, but metaphorically have a way of scratching a mouse's epigenome. And the way we do that is actually we cut the DNA. We create these double strand breaks, let the cell heal them without making mutations. So there's no change to the digital information. But what we see is the process of proteins moving around and trying to repair that DNA eventually introduces this epigenomic noise. And the genes that were once on, many of them get turned off and those that were once off come on. And so liver cells start to lose their identity, skin cells start to lose their identity. Um, and the consequence we think is aging and we actually will hopefully publish a paper that shows that if you create this noise in a mouse, it will go through accelerated aging. Uh, and not just looking old, it is actually literally old. If we measure the, the epigenetic clock, uh, and I think many of your uh, listeners and viewers will know that there's a clock you can measure from blood in our bodies or in a mouse and it'll tell you how old the animal is or we are biologically. If we do that with our mice that we've scratched up, they are literally, molecularly, 50% older, which is great. Okay, but you might say, well, David, that that's all fun, but why do we care about making a mouse older? Well, first of all, it's good evidence that we're right about the hypothesis, that every aspect of aging is recapitulated. Second of all, we have mice now that we can change the rate of aging and perhaps even accelerate aging so that they behave more like humans and we can p potentially have a better mo mouse model for Alzheimer's, for example. But then the third thing is if you can give an animal something, then you can actually, with that knowledge, take it away. And that's what we've done with George in collaboration with George. What we did actually was we wanted to reprogram the cells so that the, the genes that were once, let's start with this, the ones on, um, now they they go back off and vice versa. So genes that were once off come back on. And the, what we find is that by using these three Yamanaka factors, you can actually find the original information in the cell that tells it to be young again. And those genes actually switch and uh, the cell behaves like it's young again. And in the case of the, the retina, uh, we have preliminary results that uh, we can actually restore eyesight by rejuvenating the, the nerves in the retina to be young again. Um, and so that's uh, early days of what I hope is the future where we can reprogram cells in the body. It doesn't have to be the retina, it can be any cell type in the body we think, uh, to actually not just act young, but literally be molecularly young again. Yeah. And in my career, I've seen a lot of cool stuff and, and I haven't seen anything this cool before. We're, we're, not, we're, actually, we're actually just giving uh, the, the genes to the organism where Turning on gene. Oh, with a, a virus, they had no virus? Right. We do, okay. we use the virus that's, that's used by pharmaceutical companies to correct genetic diseases. So it's a, an FDA approved uh, virus that, that uh, is very easy to use in the eye, actually. One injection, there's no immune response in the eye, at least not a big one. And so that's why we chose the eye, actually. Uh, it's not just that we, we saw it as a challenge to reverse blindness, but we also knew that um, it could be the quickest path 
to uh, to testing this in people and helping them with this new technology. So is this mostly a local effect that you're achieving? Uh, well, in the eye, yes, uh, and, and by design. Um, we don't know the full safety profile yet, so we want to be careful. But we have injected mice uh, intravenously with the virus, and we've got mice that are healthy 10 months later. And so far, so good. You know, it's early days. We've only been testing it on about 100 mice. So we have a lot more to do, and it's many years of work to make sure it's safe. Sure. But, uh, yeah, I think the, the promise is there, and it's just hopefully evidence, if not proof in principle, that aging is more reversible than we ever thought. Do you have plans on putting genes in to make additional sirtuins, like all of the seven, hertu seven sirtuin genes in humans, uh, to augment those? I mean, that's going to be better than a, than a sirtuin activator if you can have them be on all the time, wouldn't it be? Yeah, it would. I only use viruses when absolutely necessary. I think the well-trodden path of small molecules means that there's a much greater chance of success and less chance of side effects and toxicity. With viruses, as, as great as they are and as how exciting they sound, it's still a pretty, it's still early days. We don't know about that. So I, I, I don't see a use for um, viruses and sirtuins in humans at this point, but I, so I'll stick with small molecules. But what I, I do see a future, you know, if you want to go crazy with predictions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's, that's that, that we, we could see a world where where people do choose to be genetically modified. Um, it, it's their choice, right? You wouldn't. I don't think you can easily go in and modify children, even though it, that's now being done, um, unless it's life threatening, of course. But adults, you know, they should be able to have a choice if there's if there's mm -hmm. safety and, and it, it's approved, then they should be able to do that. And that maybe there'll be a day when we are able to carry these Yamanaka genes in our body uh, and when we get sick or we have an injury uh, let's say we, we have a detached retina or we have a broken spine uh, then we get an IV that turns on those genes for a month we recover reju rejuvenate and then we turn them off again until we need them again and that would be a, a pretty wild sci-fi future but mm -hmm. all science is pointing to at least um, the biology being possible I believe in your book you mentioned that there's no rational biological requirement for death that not necessarily mortality but you could live hundreds of years theoretically so i'm wondering in your mind what you perceive as the best bridge to pass this the, the clearly 120 year limit that humans currently have would it be uh resetting the that uh, epigen the methylation clock the horvath methylation clock back to zero with like hematopoietic stem cells, or what do you think is the the biggest step to do that? Right. Well, so I put my money on on the DNA methylation reprogramming right now. It's uh, you know I've I've seen old mice re regain their eyesight. I haven't, haven't seen any technology able to do that previously. So if you, if you applied that technology in combination with some of the molecules we've talked about, about today mm -hmm. in combination with a healthy lifestyle that we're trying to optimize in real time here. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think anyone can say what, what our limit is. I mean, anyone who says that there's a limit really doesn't know what they're talking about or is, is lying. We really don't know what's possible. People who have lived in to 110, 115, they've typically smoked, they've done no exercise, they mm -hmm. had a lot of alcohol. Uh, do you, does anyone think that if they didn't have access to the kind of things that we're talking about today, they couldn't have lived longer? I think they definitely could have. Uh, we just don't know uh, because those people are so rare and typically they didn't expect to live so long in the first place. Um, so yeah, now, now with what we know and what people in the future will know, I mean, why not? And the longer we live, the more access we have to this technology. Yeah, and, you know, so, so it, I think anything should be on the table. Um, it's hard to make predictions. It's very easy to poke holes in these things, um, and more often predictions are wrong uh, rather than right. But I can tell you that I firmly believe that anyone who says that there is a biological limit is wrong, because there are, there are plenty of species, uh, and not just trees and not just jellyfish. There are there are warm-blooded, milk-giving animals in the ocean 
uh, called whales that can live hundreds of years, way, you know, three times longer than us. They're not that different from us genetically. They figured out how to stabilize their epigenome and repair their DNA and do all the stuff you need. If we can learn from them, I think we can live a life like that. And I, I think historians will look back at the past 20 years as the turning point when we realized that this was possible and finally focused our energy on the topic.